Destruction. One of the coolest features a game can have, aside from skin stores of course, destruction fits into almost any genre. Shooters, superheroes, strategy, and even racing games benefit from destructive environments. In-game destruction is vital for game studios to pursue. Without destruction, many games would lose that charm that made them what they are. Destruction comes in many forms. You can fake it with a texture, quickly swap a good model out with a broken looking one, activate a pre-created animation, or, in a perfect world, simulate it on the fly. Imagine a game world that could be fully destroyed, top to bottom, every building, every mound of dirt, and every vehicle. Not only is this possible, but it's been done before, and it seems most studios are purposely keeping games like this unrealized because cheaper, less interesting products are easier to pump out. We'll examine every aspect of destruction and even look at a game that had it all yet decided to pull its vision back and release a substandard, downgraded version instead. But before that, you know what's destructive, but in a bad way? A GTA Online Lobby. That's why you should ditch Rockstar's servers and try out Grand RP. Grand RP is a GTA 5 RP server on PC through Rage MP. The server is huge and it's only getting bigger as they continue to expand it with new servers like English 3, continuous updates, and gameplay improvements. In Grand RP, you can join several various organizations like the LSPD, FIB, Government, Police Force, EMS, Fire Department, and five different gang factions. With the family system, you create a family with your friends that you can then start up missions with or make up your own, like robbing a store. The communication and family systems work well in a server that's built with functionality in mind. Grand RP has over 350 cars that you won't find in GTA Online. These cars can be customized as well. Gameplay is fun and enjoyable, with roughly 25 active admins on at any given time. Whether you want to race other players or prosecute troublesome street racers using the law, Grand RP offers a wide range of gameplay options for you, the player. To sign up, use the link in my description to get to their launcher download page. Register at the top right and fill out the information necessary to create your account and character. Once installed, play the launcher and choose your server. Alternatively, if you prefer, you can join through your Rage MP launcher, but their launcher makes things much easier. Look in the description or my Discord server to see updated information on when I'll be playing Grand RP so that you can join me when I'm on and see if it's for you. What's cooler? A car that does absolutely nothing when you crash into a wall? Or a car whose metal crumbles and bends on impact exactly how it should if you were to do it in real life? Even before simulating damage was possible, Rockstar Games faked damage to vehicles by swapping out vehicle parts with pre-modeled versions that looked like damage. Damage wasn't simulated, rather, it was imitated. Many older games did cosmetic damage this way. Driver on PlayStation 1 did this, along with games like Twisted Metal, Burnout, and Flatout. Flatout used pre-modeled damaged parts that were deformed based on the location impact would occur. It was done in such a convincing way that it appeared to be simulated soft body deformation. This trick was advanced for its time as the competition was still just swapping the models out to be the basic damaged versions. The track would also become littered in vehicle parts and flat out, and the debris wouldn't disappear. There's a fine line between realistic destruction and fun destruction. Cars in GTA 4 nailed fun destruction. The cars can practically flatten while still looking reasonable and remaining functional. With BeamNG on the other hand, you can lose nearly all handling and control in one subtle crash. BeamNG is fun to look at, but it's not practical for a real game. It's designed to realistically simulate damage to vehicles, and in reality, vehicles can be destroyed easily. This wouldn't work for a minute in a game like GTA, where arcade-style durability keeps your car running. While games like GTA emphasize cosmetic damage over actual damage, it does give the player a sense of realism to see their car react to their actions even if that's just stomping on the hood or hitting it with a bat for several minutes. Destroying the tail of your helicopter or the wing of your plane and losing nearly all control is exciting for the player. Avoiding obstacles becomes more difficult. You're at a higher risk of crashing. You're spiraling out of control, yet trying to stay in control at the same time, much like my real life. Most vehicles have removable pieces like hood, trunk, doors, or wheels. In Halo Infinite, the Warthog's wheels can be destroyed while still being drivable. 
Red Dead 2 lets you destroy the wagon wheels either from impact or by slowly chipping away at the spokes that keep it together. Most games that feature cars implement detachable components. Cars are not solid objects, they're a conglomeration of parts and pieces and many games usually try to emulate that. Unless you're the Matrix. <laughs> Vehicle damage is fun to watch and it's fun to play with. This is why games like Burnout did so well. While racing, you could sabotage opponents by running them off the road, destroying their car. Destruction was fully realized in Burnout's crash mode, where you'd try to achieve the highest amount of damage to a densely packed roadway, causing chain reactions and mayhem. Whether you're in a wagon, car, boat, helicopter, or plane, all rides come to an end. And what better way to go out than to go out with a bang? Buildings are the ultimate example of proper destruction. What's more astounding than a perfectly built structure losing its form to chaos, or at times, even collapsing? The collapse of structures on a massive scale makes a spectacle for the player. Few games actually simulate building destruction in real time. For example, in Battlefield 3, shooting a rocket at the wall will trigger an animation and particle effect that swaps out the wall with a missing chunk version of the model, while also playing the animation of pieces free-falling toward the ground. When you're on the battlefield and chunks of building fall off from explosions, the battle becomes more raw, as if the weapons are actually damaging and using them grants the user tangible power. The player reshapes the map through destruction, making it more difficult to hide, for instance, in the building that's now missing a wall. DICE introduced Levolution in Battlefield 4 with this in mind. However, instead of a small-scale change, certain large-scale pre-animated events could be triggered to change everything about the map, like collapsing an entire building. The Battlefield series has always prided itself on destruction, making it one of the main selling points of the series. In Battlefield 1, you could destroy chunks from buildings until the only thing left standing was the framework. In Battlefield 2, they took it a step further to where, if you destroyed enough pieces of the buildings, they would collapse. Levolution was great for the series, but as ambitions dried up, so too did the features offered in newer installments. Battlefield 2042 did minimalistic Levolution events. A sign here, a radio tower there, but nothing like what we saw eight years prior in Battlefield 4. Pre-made animations are frequently used by developers to include building destruction, because CPU resources are limited. You see it all the time in almost every game. In 2005, you could cause buildings to collapse as Hulk. Of course, you're just triggering an animation when you punch the building enough times, but it's still awesome to look at. Three years later, Mercenaries 2 upgraded the way they did collapsing buildings. In Earth Defense Force, you defend Earth with force from aliens and bugs. Buildings can be destroyed by you, the guy sent to defend them. Sometimes the only way to defend our cities is to destroy them. Iron Soldier, an almost 30-year-old game for the Atari, features full destruction. The buildings can be blown up, and despite being such an old game, the explosions and debris look pretty good. Destroy All Humans, Godzilla, Spider-Man, and many more all use pre-animated collapses to create the illusion of destruction. But what about the games that don't fake it? Are there any games that actually do it? Is it even possible? The answer is yes, and the best example is a game from 2009 called Red Faction Guerrilla. Not only could buildings be destroyed in this game, but the entire game was built specifically to simulate destruction. Structures are constantly being calculated by the engine, checking for stress and strength. As you're playing through other games that tout destruction, you'll find that what you're seeing in all cases is a special effect. When you get into Red Faction Guerrilla, what you'll find is a true physics-based and stress-based destruction system. In RFG, you physically destroy things the way you'd expect it to work in real life. Buildings have materials and weight. They creak and groan when they're under stress. They come down based on where the damage occurred. It is just based on a series of physical rules. We wanted to do a game where you could bring down buildings piece by piece. If the developers just built the buildings however they wanted with no real structural integrity in mind, there was a risk that the building could just collapse on its own. The stress on specific building pieces would be too much. This is like when something in a game doesn't break when you slowly push it with minimal force, but then you hit it with an abundant force and it breaks. Unless you're the Saints Row reboot and your objects explode from just getting touched. The building's components can withstand a set amount of stress before giving way. 
Crackdown 3 also would have had a system like this, where buildings were made of destructible framing and concrete, but this would have been calculated by servers rather than the player's hardware. Red Faction has a history of prioritizing destruction. As far back as 2001, Red Faction allowed you to destroy nearly everything on screen. They started by improving on the revolutionary Geomod engine which they had pioneered for Red Faction literally blowing away the static environment concept of competing first-person shooter games, Geomod technology allows the player to alter and destroy the game world in real time. Red Faction 2 is using an enhanced version of the Geomod engine that we featured in Red Faction 1. If pieces of a structure were destroyed in such a way that nothing was holding up the remaining pieces, they would fall. We wanted to increase the number of ways and the number of solutions a player could approach any situation with. And we did so just by making everything that we could think of destructible. Make it feel like you can blow apart absolutely everything in the world. And I think that's what players really enjoy doing. Red Faction isn't the only game to feature destroyable buildings. Games like Medieval Engineers, Detonate, Seven Days to Die, Mercenaries, and Crisis all have collapsible buildings that are calculated on the spot. Crisis was released a year earlier than Mercenaries 2, and not only does it look better, but it also did destruction better. Everything had physics and acted upon other objects. Sheds could be brought down if the player destroyed them. But you can't talk about building destruction, or destruction in general, without mentioning teardown. It's in the name. It simulates destruction on any scale, live. Buildings can be brought down by destroying all voxels that are keeping it up. Unlike Red Faction Guerrilla, however, a single voxel is powerful enough to hold an entire structure together in Teardown. This is the biggest downside, but with a few mods installed, Teardown starts to play more like you'd hope. It also depends on how the maps are being built. Buildings collapse in on themselves, or fall over, taking neighboring buildings down with them. Instead of taking the stairs or finding an elevator, a player can destroy the floor and drop down to the floor below. If a theoretical first-person shooter used full-scale simulated destruction similar to Teardown and used it as the foundation of its gameplay, it would be a truly next-gen experience. The war zone could be set in a metropolitan type of area where two or multiple teams fight it out. If the enemy team has claimed a skyscraper and is using it as a vantage point, your team could fire a rocket at the face of the building and in the process either kill or reveal them. Alternatively, you could set up charges at the base of the building and detonate them, bringing the building down. If you can't get to the base of their building, use another building to strategically tip towards theirs, ultimately destroying both. One way that battles are enhanced is by having interactive environments. Being able to shoot through walls to get enemies adds a problem-solving element to the game. Rainbow Six Siege offers a small playing field but with big possibilities with how to navigate it. Players aren't restricted to using only the doorways. Rather, they can create their own entrance and raid the area. This complicates things for the players defending as now they have to add barricades or watch for walls that may come down. Sometimes destruction is the direct byproduct of a game's story. In Blast Corps, you destroy buildings, farms, and other structures to make way for a runaway nuclear missile carrier. Destruction is tied to gameplay, forcing the player to clear a pathway for the nuke. In Hatred, the main character is a maniac on a killing spree, so of course he should be able to drive directly through homes in stolen vehicles. Bringing buildings down is fun. In games. Not in real life. Unless you have permission to do it. No matter the game or the method, building destruction is a spectacle for us as pyroman- players. For us as players. Whether you're a grunt on a battlefield, an incredible hulk, or a defender of earth, no building should stand in the way of your path of destruction. If there was a bar that showed the level of believability for destruction, decals or image layers would be near the bottom. The absolute lowest would be if literally nothing happened, not even a particle effect. But the combination of decals and particle effects is used in almost every game to fake destruction where nothing is really happening. In most cases, these decals will slowly fade away over time to free up memory. You'll see it all over the place, be it in a crack, burn mark, or on glass. Particles that appear when impact occurs help both add to the illusion and cover the sudden appearance of a texture being slapped on the surface. Sometimes developers design their games almost entirely around destructible set pieces. 
Racing games do this a lot. Need for Speed Most Wanted let players lose the cops by using certain locations as pursuit breakers. These environmental traps would take out cops when triggered. Split Second maximized the use of triggerable set-piece destruction. In Split Second, you play as a racer on a fictional reality TV program where participants race for money and fame. Each map was designed to feature unique obstacles, shortcuts, and even rerouted paths via destruction. Using your power play meter, you could destroy opponents by using the map. The coolest feature is the fact that you can practically destroy the map to the point that you have to take alternative routes. For instance, collapsing the convention center tower forces you to drive up and through its remains and across rooftops. Or you can destroy the dam and reveal its inner structure as you travel through what's left of it. Action during a race like this can be found in Motorstorm Apocalypse too. The game has more than 40 tracks that can be altered by catastrophic earthquakes and tornadoes. Helicopters can crash through buildings. The chaotic spectacle is the appeal. In Just Cause 3's campaign, Bases had to be overthrown by blowing everything up. Massive towers or explosive gas tanks could be brought down by destroying the beams perching them up. The best parts of the game for me were moments like sending a massive explosive tank off the ledge of a cliff just to watch it erupt in a raging gulf of flames and smoke that were sent higher than where it stood before. The bridges in the game could also be brought down. One of the more spectacular things is the bridge. That's fully indestructible. In most cases, you know, depending on where you sort of place these explosives or how you explode it, uh, different pieces will sort of activate and come off. Like if I decide that um, I'm going to blow up the middle part and the two sides, but sometimes one of them doesn't always fall. They'll just sort of sit there and hang. You know, you see cars kind of like... <laughs> these bridges and red-white colored structures were built once and then thrown all over the map for the player to toy with. When I was younger, I remember playing boom blocks with my uncle. We'd compete for scores and try to bring down massive stacks in the fewest throws. Forge maps from Halo 3 like Jenga were similar in a sense, and we played them around that time too. Even if the destruction isn't being simulated, like in Spider-Man where it's all happening through pre-made animations, the set pieces can still be some of the best parts of the game. The Force Unleashed's most memorable moment for me is a pre-made segment just like this, where you're using the Force to bring down an Imperial Star Destroyer. I'd like to see Rey do that. Terrain, or the ground, is a solid, immovable material in virtually every game. Even when you drop a bus on a cement street, nothing will alter the appearance of the ground, when in reality, things like this should create a crater. Some games like Battlefield do implement craters, where explosives can create pits and ditches in the ground. As a kid, I would play games with my friend Matthew across the street, and when we played Red Faction 2, we found out you could tunnel through a certain map's rock wall and it blew our minds. We spent hours tunneling and creating different routes. There wasn't a lot to do back then, as you can tell. We were literally playing with dirt, virtually. Indie games seem to focus more on terrain manipulation and destruction. Astroneer lets you dig into the planet and create your bases, Deep Rock Galactic is a mining game that has you traversing massive cave systems where you can dig in any direction you want. Spin Tires simulates muddy ground with heavy vehicles that displace mud and dirt. And the biggest indie game of all, Minecraft, wouldn't be what it is without terrain manipulation and destruction. Terrain destruction isn't just about changing the shape of the ground, it's also about destroying the trees or letting natural destruction take its course, like fire. In Red Dead 2, fire spreads and burns everything in its path. The developers had to figure out how the fire would spread on what surfaces and objects, and how being burned would affect those objects. Minecraft also has fire destruction, as fire will spread wherever it can, if the material is flammable. Water can also damage things like torches and redstone if they're in its path. If object destruction was missing in a game with weapons, the player would immediately notice. He wouldn't be able to influence the environment at all, even though they're wielding a tool that is capable of doing just that. When a player shoots bottles, chairs, tables, books, or TV screens, and nothing happens, the player feels dissatisfied. If the effects your weapon has on the world are absent, there is no incentive to use the weapon. The weapon loses its purpose. Control and Max Payne 3 are great examples of object destruction, as nearly everything can break, crumble, or be interacted with. Nothing is cooler than Max Payne diving through the air in slow motion while paper and debris are flying all over the room. The Halo games are packed with objects that can be damaged. When destroying a barrier, chunks break off piece by piece. 
When pallets are destroyed, the original model vanishes, immediately replaced by broken pallet pieces that are occupying the same space, therefore quickly flinging apart, mimicking the explosion of wood breaking. Katamari Damacy, I'm probably saying that wrong, is a weird game where you roll around as a sticky ball called a Katamari trying to collect increasingly larger objects. Starting small, you work your way up to grabbing mountains. Most games don't feature such a ridiculous amount of objects. Most games throw in a few models with destructive features and litter them throughout the world to make it feel like these interactive objects are everywhere, distracting you from the fact that everything you see is solid and immovable. For instance, GTA 4 has benches, mailboxes, and streetlights nearly everywhere. Without them, you'd quickly remember that everything else you see is permanent. The buildings are fake, the bricks are impervious. Fighter games like Marvel Nemesis include props that can be thrown or destroyed if a player himself is thrown into them. Objects can be slowly destroyed throughout the fight as well. In a game about violent combat and brutality, it's nice to see that the arena isn't immune to collateral damage. Video games benefit from destruction when it's done to benefit the story and gameplay appropriately. Nearly every game benefits from features like this. In a game like Ultimate Spider-Man, where you play as Venom, you have to feel like there's a difference in the gameplay that satisfies the expectations for playing as a villain. Throwing vehicles around and eating people does just that. A Superman game similar to Superman Returns made in this day and age with fully destructive environments would be awesome. The city's health bar decreases as it takes damage. Superman can't die, but Metropolis can. Enemies as tall as skyscrapers tower over the city causing mayhem. Flying low through the city could add an element of difficulty, because if you miss a turn, you could fly directly through the building, partly damaging the city. Heat vision could slice through buildings and cars. If done right, you could cause a building to collapse or tip. Super Breath could throw and hurl objects down the street, damaging store windows and more. It wouldn't just be a texture on the wall, it would be live simulated destruction. Landing on the ground too hard could break through the street, creating a crater to the city's sewage. Superman is the ultimate character to use for a game focused on destruction. Why don't we get games like this? We get the same games every year. Do companies just not want to make money? Are these things possible? Of course. Not only because they've been doing it for decades, but because essentially one guy alone on his computer was able to make it happen with Teardown. We're not giving the industry the credit it deserves, mainly because we've been fooled into believing that we're getting the best we can get. Play GTA 4 from 2008 for a few minutes and compare it to Watch Dogs Legion from 2020. How does GTA 4 have better mechanics in almost every category than Legion? Why doesn't one single game feel as real as Red Dead Redemption 2? Because Ubisoft and other game companies prioritize everything but gameplay in their games. To them, it's a product made only to make money within a time frame and to be churned out year after year with product after product. Passion, innovation, and soul are all dying qualities in the industry. The few games that dare to take the needed step forward are mysteriously shut down with game directors leaving in the wake. Then ultimately, they're downgraded into oblivion, a mere shadow of what they could have been. As I've mentioned before, Crackdown 3 is the quintessential example of a failed system. High aspirations and working game models all cut and slashed to release a forgettable game. I've already forgotten it. What am I talking about? Crackdown 3 had a functioning, destructible city with buildings made up of framework, concrete, and plaster that could all be destroyed with enough damage in the right spots. The buildings would collapse into each other and spread chaos wherever you sent them. This was back on the Xbox One, last gen. The Xbox itself couldn't handle the workload, so multiple servers on Microsoft's cloud would compute the heavy calculations for you and send your Xbox the information it needed to show the result of massive collapses. This sounds expensive on a large scale for Microsoft to fund. Hundreds of thousands of users collapsing buildings, each using multiple servers, adds up fast. These giant companies don't think it's worth it yet to offer actual next generation experiences to us. Oh, but they'll blow millions on game streaming services one minute, then shut them down the next. We're just cows that need a good milking, forced to deal with a market filled with games that look indistinguishable. Innovation was prime in the earlier days of video games, where there was competition for developers to find ways to deliver more on young advancing hardware. The ground up improvements continued with faster load times, higher frame rates, better graphics, more detailed enemies, motion capture animation, and smarter AI. 
Each year, games would not only look insanely better, but they would also include more and more features that were previously thought to be impossible. That's where we are now, in the stage where we don't think better is possible, so we take what we can get. Unreal Engine should be recognized for their efforts to push the industry forward. They've put work into making destruction streamlined and easy to work with. Nvidia has also contributed to advancement in destruction, with open source engine tools like PhysX. A Superman game, or a Warzone Battlefield type of game like I described earlier, would be highly sought after by gamers. The market is saturated with the same stuff year after year. Players want to see a change, something that stands out, something innovative. When Superman heat visions a wall, something should happen to that building. When you're shooting rockets at the base of a building repeatedly, it should come down. Destruction is the medium for which action finds consequence where pursuit meets result. Without destruction, we run in a race that leads nowhere, shooting objects that remain still, crashing cars that simply bounce unaffected. We need destruction in our games in order to see the effect our decisions have around us. Why do anything if it does nothing? We need to reward the games that innovate like Teardown. We should demand more from companies that keep taking advantage of us. The only truly destructive thing about destruction in video games is how the industry keeps ignoring it, putting it on the back burner while they spend resources on unimportant things like skin stores and slightly prettier graphics. I want to see games that aren't soulless, lifeless husks. I want to see games that push the bar higher. We're not advancing like we used to, we're plateauing. The focus of these companies needs to be rethought, rebuilt, but for that to happen, first, it has to be destroyed.